call it all those little friends you never knew you had. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we have a long history with this to the point where we actually put together an informational website on skin parasites and delusional infestation. We've also developed very thick skins and a lot of patience. Oh, and as I'm going along, if you guys have questions, let me know. Um, I, I have no problem with that at all. I, I published a review of the topic in Acta Dermatologica a couple of years back, and I think we have that posted on the website too. Okay, so let me start with skin parasites, right? Because this is really where everybody focuses, but there's a need for a reality check. And let's face it, very few invertebrates feed on skin, human skin or otherwise. You know, and these would include things like mites, fleas, flies of various kinds, lice. With just a tiny number of exceptions, uh, they all feed and leave. Really only one or maybe two examples of these parasites that actually stay on or in the skin. All of them leave telltale signs, right? You're gonna have itchy round red swellings or crustose rashes. Um, in any case, it's going to be itchy, okay? Now, the real parasites, you know, we know these. Nest mites, house mosquitoes, scabies mites, hair follicle mites, fleas, lice, bed bugs. These are the ones that feed on human skin. We'll talk about nest mites first because this is one of the things that everybody says, oh, I have bird mites or I have, you know, rat mites. The commonest of these that someone's likely to encounter um, in a home or in a building would be the rat mite, fowl mite, or pigeon mite. These are all nest parasites. So you get bitten when, for example, someone has gone in and eradicated the adult whatever it happens to be, a bird or rats or something like this, the mites are still there in the nest. If you don't remove the nest materials and treat, you could have a continuing problem because they're going to look for something else warm to bite, okay? And this is a classic example. The photograph was one of our staff who um, was realistically, I mean, he, he was bitten by foul mites in a facility on campus. So that's, we know that's what those were and you can see he's been scratching them. <laughs> Okay, house mosquitoes, this could be potentially a growing problem because we've had a number of these exotic mosquitoes get established in the state. And this includes Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, Aedes albopictus, which is another pest mosquito, Notoscriptus, which is in Southern Oregon, probably in Northern, Northern California, and Aedes japonicus. And these are what we would call urban sort of indoor breeders. They're, they're they like small amounts of water to breed in. And they will bite in the daytime, they bite indoors, they'll breed and rest indoors. So potentially they're gonna be a, an annoying problem. Okay, scabies mites. Now, these leave very, very distinctive crustose rashes. You, you can't, you know, you can't just say, oh my, I must have scabies because I itch. Uh, they they leave very definitive uh, remains <clears throat> and they can be diagnosed by skin scrapings. Follicle mites, oh yeah, we all have them, whether you like it or not. If you have dandruff, you have too many follicle mites. But, you know, this is sort of part of our sort of human um, ecosystem, you might say. So they're going to be in your eyebrows, probably your eyelashes, perhaps other, you know, uh, beard hairs, things like that in the follicles. You never know it. They don't really do much. Now, fleas, I'm sure you're encountering these. This is an increasingly bad urban problem. And that's because we've become very tolerant of ur urban wildlife. Things like possums, raccoons, rats, feral cats, coyotes, and so on. To the point where in LA, they now have episodes of murine typhus being transmitted because of the large numbers of fleas and these sort of urban wildlife animals. Yeah. 
Okay, lice, right? Human lice, we have three different kinds, and they're, they're for the most part, doing pretty well. Head lice, this is pretty much an elementary school, nursery school kind of issue. Um, the easiest solution for this is simply shaving the kid's head, which works well for boys, but probably not girls. <laughs> Body lice, classic in the homeless populations. And pubic lice, yeah, adults um, doing things. And so I, I thought you'd enjoy the picture of the pubic lice on the lower right um, in somebody's eyelashes. So I'll leave that one to your imagination. <laughs> okay, bed bugs. Help, we're seeing an uptick in that too. Um, increasingly, we're finding them in hotel rooms, dormitories, subsidized housing, nursing homes, home homes, you know, people's houses, they bring them back. Okay, so these are the real human skin parasites. Now, Morgellons are a term, this is a term you'll probably hear. This was a so-called organism that was described in 1674 by a Sir Thomas Brown. And he described the Morgellon. Now, imagine what um, microscope optics were like in those days. And he described something which, if you look at it closely, kind of resembles lint and hair and, you know, stuff matted together. And he de described this as a disease of afflicting French children with harsh hairs on their backs. I don't think anything's changed since then. <laughs> but that's, you know, Morgellons are one of the things that you will hear people um, talking about when they have, think they have skin parasites. <clears throat> okay, so let's go into a little bit about the physiology of scratching. What does scratching do? It may temporarily interrupt nerve impulses, right? So it might temporarily stop the cracks, itching sensation. Done sufficiently, you might cause transient damage to skin nerves. Persistent scratching can induce all kinds of skin issues. Uh, redness, papules, which are itchy lumps, crusting the skin, all of this because you scratch, all right? And let's face it, with certain kinds of things, it really feels good too. <laughs> but think of what goes on when you scratch. This is what's found underneath the average human fingernail. A whole variety of bacteria, including Pseudomonas and Staph, fungi, including the ones that cause, um, you know, various infections of your feet, for example. <clears throat> Yeasts, like candida, which is a kind of, you know, kind of fungus. And basically, ew, right? Do you really want that stuff scratched into your skin? So, like I say, it's probably best not to scratch. <laughs> so, this comes back to what I call Kimsey's rule, okay? With, with insect and mite bites, things like this, they will last two weeks if you don't scratch. If you do scratch, two months. All right, so this is the Kimsey's 2-2 two -two rule. <laughs> so don't scratch. Okay, now, the reality of insect bites. Now, I had to show you this picture. This is a former student of mine who uh, had a job feeding colonies of mosquitoes. And that's his forearm, and that's actually what I'm using as the, the background image for all of these slides, is the picture from his forearm. So every one of those sort of pale lumps is a mosquito bite. That's a true, legitimate mosquito bite. This is what they look like if you don't scratch, and they go away pretty quickly, you know. <clears throat> okay, bites, real or not, okay? So you have four different possibilities with these images. A bacterial infection in the skin, sugar bites, methamphetamine, and more gallons. Okay? Here's the reality. Or gallons don't exist. There is no such thing. Methamphetamine, it's all self-induced scratching. Methamphetamine, 
triggers the nerves between the brain and the skin, causing transient pinching, crawling sensations. It's one of the things that meth is known for. Uh, chigger bites, yeah, a little, little sore spot in the middle with a very itchy, round um, sphere around it. And then bacterial infection. Now, this is a picture of MRSA. Notice that each of the lumps has a little transparent blister on top of it. And that's a classic symptom of a bacterial skin infection and not an insect or a mite bite. Okay, but what if there isn't a rash, right? If there's no rash, but the person you're talking to complains of symptoms of itching, pinching, crawling sensations in their skin, but there's no rash. Therefore, there's no evidence directly of parasites. Then you have to think delusional infestation. You have to consider that because ordinarily, regardless of how many times somebody's been exposed to any of these biting insects and mites, you will get an itchy lump. It's just the way your skin responds to it. <clears throat> So skin sensations, okay, let's, that's sort of the basic thing to what we're talking about here. Pruritus, these are the doctor's terms for these things. Pruritus is unpleasant skin sensations that result from scratching. Chronic pruritus, the itching may be periodic, localized, but long-term, right? So it, it keeps coming back. Willen's itch or senior, <coughs> sorry, senior, <laughs> I can't even talk today. Senile pruritus is chronic itch in the elderly. And I, I'll discuss that a little bit more. And then paresthesia or formication is, formication is like ants crawling on your skin. In other words, it's crawling, pinching, burning sensations in the skin. Okay, so these are commonly used terms in the literature and, and by doctors. So what causes skin sensations? All right. It's interesting because one neuropathway causes pain or, you know, gives you the pain signal, or it's one pathway between where the source is and your brain. But there are multiple pathways involved in itch, right? Some of it is serotonin mediated on the surface of the skin. And this is something that would be triggered by things like mosquito bites, poison oak, poison oak. The other thing, another pathway, is actually triggered by nerve damage between the skin and the brain. And this is, I think, where most of the sensations in people who have delusional infestation are coming from. Okay. Other terms that have been used for delusional infestation are delusional parasitosis. Yeah, okay, one of those is delusional parasitosis. <laughs> Um, Ekbom's syndrome, Munchausen syndrome, and of course delusional parasitosis. And as you've probably encountered, sufferers know that they're infested with parasites. And this is part of the problem in dealing with this uh, particular issue. They, they know. You, you can't tell them anything. You have no idea. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you're a doctor, somebody on the street, pest control specialist, they know better than you. Now, Ekbom syndrome at one time was used to describe sensations of parasites. Now the term is used for what's called restless leg syndrome, which I think is kind of interesting. <laughs> it's a, it's a, quite a transition from one to the other. <clears throat> okay, so people who suffer from this issue, you know, they, they report parasites under their skin, around body openings and or the stomach or bowels or, you know, they want you to look at poo samples, for example. They believe that the parasites infest their homes, their pets, their vehicles, clothing, even other family members like children. Um, they will ask doctors, any doctor who will listen to them for treatment for this infestation. Oftentimes people are given, <laughs> I can't even believe they do this, they're given ivermectin, which has absolutely nothing to do with anything having to do with this problem. Um, they will bring samples 
debris, lint, skin flakes, etc. for inspection. And there is actually a term for this, which tells you how much it's done. Uh, materials packaged in envelopes, boxes, etc. This is called the matchbox sign when someone is presenting their symptoms along with these materials. This is the kind of stuff that we get. I'm sure you've seen these too. Um, very, very carefully packaged samples of different kinds of things. <laughs> we do, here in the museum, we probably do about 40 cases a year. And this is the kind of stuff that we get. What I find really interesting though is with the COVID shutdown for the past year, year and a half, something like this, the number of people calling us actually dropped. And I don't understand why, because I would have predicted that it would go in the opposite direction, that because people are isolated, they're spending time alone, that somehow they would have focused more on this than they evidently did. Either that or you guys are getting the calls and we're not. But we've noticed a real drop off. It was at one point where we might get three or four calls a week. Uh, now it's maybe three or four a month, which is kind of an interesting difference. Okay, so people who've suffered from this. Okay, you notice I'm not saying they're crazy because that's, I don't believe that's the case at all. But people who suffer from this, okay, these are the sort of classic things that they've had the infestation for a long time. They've been seen by numerous specialists. They reject negative findings. Oh, you can't be right because I know they're there. I just didn't find them for you. Um, they often exhibit this matchbox sign. Worse yet, they may engage in self-mutilation, uh, use home remedies. They have a, many times a distrust in prescription drugs um, and will expose themselves to dangerous chemicals. And families can, are really problematic because multiple family members may buy into this issue. They they sort of buy into the shared delusion, even though there's probably only one person who actually has the problem. You, know, you get this buy-in. And depending on how many people get involved, we call it a folie à deux, which means two people, folie à trois, three people, and so on. Now, when you get children involved in this, that becomes an entirely different issue. If someone is self-medicating and they're also treating their children that's the time to call Child Protective Services because that can go south really quickly. And we've had to do it once or twice because it's, well, because of this, okay? So self-treatments involve things like bleach baths. This woman is in the hospital because she poured bleach right out of the bottle over her skin. The use of insecticides, cutting, scratching, herbal remedies of various kinds, none of which work. And of course, then doctors are feeding the beast by giving people ivermectin, which does nothing. And it's probably fairly toxic. <clears throat> okay, so classic sufferers. They have the crawling, pinching sensations in the skin. They see hairs, black dots, fibers moving on or in the skin. Uh, they see parasites in these fibers and, and tiny objects in the air around them on surfaces. Uh, so if they're looking out a window and the sunlight's coming into the window and they're seeing you know, little particles of lint stuff, they know that those skin parasites are flying to them and they're going to attack them. And eventually the problem dominates their lives. I mean, in a bad way. <clears throat> Now, what we found over having done this for over 30 years is that people who suffer from this come from a wide variety of occupational and socioeconomic backgrounds, even including medical personnel. I can't tell you how many nurses we've dealt with. They generally hold average or above average intelligence, reasonable views of reality other than this particular issue. Um, and we don't find any kind of entomophobia or any fear of insects, they generally lack that. But one thing that plays into this is they are often obsessive compulsive, right? So you saw those pictures of the packaging, very neatly wrapped, everything's put in a little in its position. And this seems to go hand in hand with uh, 
most of the delusional parasitosis we've seen. Okay, so some stats on, on people we've seen or talked to, right? I'd say half were postmenopausal women. The other, most of the rest were drug abusers of all ages and sexes. Uh, only about 1% were truly neurological issues. Um, people who are paraquadriplegic often have these transient or ongoing uh, crawling pinching sensations, and that's serious nerve damage. Elderly men sometimes, only 1% would be what I would classify as clinically psychotic in any real sense. And it seems to affect all racial and cultural groups. All right, these people are desperate for solutions because the symptoms keep them awake at night sometimes, they obsess over them, they never go away in some cases, and they have to have a solution. And so there are all these things, ugh, so many bad things online that people can fall into rabbit holes. Um, there's something called Chemtrail Central, where supposedly the chemtrails from jets and so on are actually causing these problems. Uh, there are NUPSA, which is the National Unidentified Skin Parasite Association, um, the Morgellons Research Foundation, all of those these organizations are based on the assumption that there's a real as yet undefined organism involved. So they explain it this way. The Morgellons are an unknown disease. Sufferers from this condition report a range of cutaneous symptoms, including crawling, biting, stinging sensations, granules, threads, or black speck-like materials on or beneath the skin, and so on. And this is, comes directly from the Morgellons Research Foundation. One of the more publicly known sufferers for, from Morgellons was Joni Mitchell, the singer. Okay, Morgans, Morgellons are this unknown organism that infests humans. It's only reported in the developing world or developed world, I should say. Is this a scientific conspiracy? You know, and yet think about this. If it were truly an unknown new organism infesting human skin, that would be the holy grail for someone like me, a taxonomist. My whole job basically is the discovery and description of new species. Why would we cover this up? It would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I could, you, you'd be in the news forever, but there's nothing there. So, some other explanations that we've had. Calimbola, this is a big one. Uh, springtails, the National Pediculosis Association reported Calimbola in skin scrapings from people who have this syndrome, and it was actually published in the Journal of the New York Entomological Society, for which they should be embarrassed. Strepsiptera. These are twisted wing parasites of insects. I don't know where this one came from. We, we have no idea. Bird mites, sometimes that can be real. And then the one we heard the, most recently a couple of years back were flukes or flatworms. This is the latest explanation. Now, can you imagine a flatworm burrowing into the skin? The closest that anything comes to this is something that you ingest, for example, or that you walk on, uh, like uh, some of the um, little nematodes. But flatworms, no, not likely. Okay, here's the other problem. Hey, hey Lynn. Yeah. Sorry, I was just wondering, um, two slides back, Morgellon slide, what was the picture that uh, you showed? Right before this one there. What is that? Oh, that's, that's a classic photograph that we get from people. It's uh, a scab with lint in it. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd enjoy that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's like the kind of stuff they actually send us. So we tell people, look, if you, if you have samples like this, collect it with transparent tape and then tape it onto a white file card or a piece of white paper. And then we can look at it under the microscope. We can take it off if we need to and so on. And so this is the kind of thing that we get. Mm, Transparent thanks. tape works great. Yeah. Aren't you glad you asked? 
I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see here. All right. So I was about to rant about physicians. Physicians do not deal with this problem well. They're not trained to deal with it. And most often they will simply respond to the patient's self-diagnosis. And I found this wonderful quote from The Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Bierce years, centuries ago, that a diagnosis, a physician's forecast of the disease by the patient's pulse and purse. It just goes to show you that even a couple hundred years ago, people were on the right page with some of this stuff. I don't know. But physicians either have no patience with this, they, or they don't have the time, or they simply don't know how to deal with it. Now, let's talk about some causes, because this is really, I guess, what you guys are really most interested in, or should be, okay? Let's start with what people mostly attribute this to, that somehow it's some kind of mental issue that people are, are having, um, various psychoses like schizophrenia, paranoia, anxiety disorders, obsession states, are all things that have been, that it's been attributed to. But these are really relatively rare. Maybe 1% of the people we've talked to clearly had one of these issues. But there are a lot of other really more obvious causes, all right? So think about physical illness, okay, drugs you take. So all these things on this list will cause crawling, pinching, itching sensations. And they're known, they're known symptoms, okay? So drug, drug use, certain drugs will cause this. Liver disease causes it. Diabetes, especially when you get neuropathy, number one on the hit parade. Nerve damage of various kinds. Hypo and hyperthyroidism, in other words, too much thyroid hormone, too little. Various cancers, cerebrovascular disease, tuberculosis, vitamin deficiencies, HIV, uh, Parkinson's is another one that causes this, and there are, there are other medical issues that will also cause these symptoms. I mean, very realistically, if you look at descriptions of these different syndromes, one of the things they talk about is nerve damage that causes pinching, crawling, itching sensations. Drugs, okay, and I'm, now I'm talking about legal drugs. Um, some of the opiates will do this. Antidepressants will do this. Some of the antibiotics will do it, cause those symptoms. Those for treating hypertension, antihistamines, antipsychotics, cardiovascular treatments, etc will cause these symptoms. Huh. But <laughs> number one on the hit parade, methamphetamine. Without question, tweakers, people who use methamphetamine excessively have these symptoms. And why do you think they call them tweakers? Because the drug causes them to pick at their skin. I mean, to the point where they do serious damage sometimes. Heroin and some of the opiates will also cause some of this and cocaine, but methamphetamine is number one on the hit parade. 45% of the people we deal with either use meth, heroin, or cocaine, especially crack. Still, it's mostly meth. And they self-injure in, uh, unbelievably. Um, just, I don't know, what, does serious nerve damage. Okay, if they smoke it or inject it, Meth is highly addictive, physically destructive. So even if you weren't picking at yourself, the drug itself is causing damage, really low rehab rates, and the users almost universally get what they call meth mites, right? These are skin sores caused by meth toxicity. It's bad stuff. And self-mutilation, picking at themselves. So this is a picture of a woman who went through the whole thing, right? She started using meth after six months. You can see what she's done to her face. After four years, the damage is probably irreparable. This affects all age groups, from teens all the way up into people in their 60s. 
all socioeconomic groups, including soccer moms and street people. It often, maybe always, involves skin picking or tweaking. It's also linked to hepatitis and HIV transmission. And I don't know if this is something I should say, but fortunately it seems like meth is being overtaken by heroin, but <laughs> at least the symptoms are different, and perhaps not as immediately destructive. Okay. You guys are so quiet, it's hard to talk to you. <laughs> okay. So if it's not a psychiatric issue, and if it's not drug-induced, then what? Okay, because sufferers exhibit symptoms of chronic itch or chronic pruritus, paresthesia, which is this crawling, pinching, itching sensations, and peripheral nerve damage. So I took a list of all the kinds of syndromes you could have, things that could happen to you, that and plotted th those symptoms. Okay, so ranging from HIV and AIDS, carbon monoxide poisoning, to vitamin B deficiencies. Look at the overlap. All three of these things cause, are caused by these syndromes. Might paresthesia, pruritus, delusional infestation. Yeah, there, there's an awful lot going on that could explain the symptoms of the person that you're talking to, right? They're not nuts. I mean, to be honest, I feel sorry for them because I can't help them and I don't think the medical profession will help them unless they do certain kinds of things, okay? Here are prescribed medications that are known to cause paresthesia and pruritus as side effects. I don't know if you can see them, but it, it ranges from things like acetaminophen and codeine to um, warfarin, uh, all, all sorts of different compounds. Yeah, there's quite a list, and this is just a partial list, but you can see the, I've checked off on the table the symptoms that each of these is known to cause. <clears throat> now, there are additional problems in the elderly, uh, particularly Caucasians. Yay! Our skin is not designed for um, sun. It's, it's designed for fogs and clouds. Um, and so as you get older, no comments, um, you get solar elastosis. This is a particularly a problem, obviously, in California, and this is sun damage to the skin. Um, this also, as you age, this can you can accumulate nerve damage. Then, like I said, the medications you take, and we're all on something at that, once you get, hit 60, um, will do this. Dementia, like Alzheimer's, will cause some of these symptoms. Isolation and stress. This is why I was so astonished that the COVID shutdown didn't give us more <laughs> clients. Um, and then in women, hormone changes can affect all of this as well, because one of the things is, with changes in hormones is skin thinning. And that also can cause problems with nerve damage and uh, signal transmission between the surface of your skin or the interior of your skin and your brain. Okay, so how do you deal with people who suffer from this? Number one, be patient. Number two, never agree with their diagnosis without actual hard evidence. Number three, be patient. Number four, ask for details, particularly do they have a rash and what does it look like? Ask about drug use. You have to be a little careful with this because um, you know you, you have to be careful. Um, and then be patient. <laughs> so un underlying all this, be patient. Example, you know, look at samples for mites or other parasites or pass them on to somebody like us because I know you do. <laughs> what we tell the sufferer, the patient, is 
four things. Do not go to a dermatologist. The last place you want to go with this issue is a dermatologist because they are only trained to look at the surface of your skin, period. They lack the training and the background to be able to solve the problem if, for example, you have diabetes, right? So you need to go to an internal medicine specialist, not a dermatologist. When you go to the doctor, I tell people, never mention the P word because the minute that comes out of your mouth, parasite, the doctor's going to go, oh, crazy person, and that's the end of your usefulness uh, or their usefulness to you. If you have not had it, I tell people, get a complete blood panel to rule out things like diabetes, hyperthyroidism, et cetera. And then finally, the last and perhaps even more important is to take a list of all of your meds and the dosages to your pharmacist because by law, they are required to tell you contraindications or side effects of these drugs. And oftentimes people are taking multiple things, especially when you get older, and they can negatively interact, right? Your doctor isn't gonna be able to do this, but you go to the pharmacist and they are legally required to. Okay, so for resources, I would suggest going to our website because we have an awful lot of this posted. Um, you can either go to delusion.ucdavis or skinparasites.ucdavis. It points, points you in the same place. And we post information as we get it. <clears throat> so why? Why do we have this issue? And part of it is that for survival value, humans are wired to make connections between events. All right, but the problem is we don't always make the right ones. And changes in your neurochemistry change your reality. Right? Your perception of the world is highly dictated by how your brain is functioning. And if it's not functioning correctly, everything can go upside down. We are characterized by our capacity for self-deception. This is the other thing that, that <laughs> you know, it, yeah. We are capable of telling ourselves things that we want, right? I have this explanation for why I itch that takes it away from me. In other words, it's not my problem internally. It's a problem, it's a parasite or it's contrails or so, it's something else's fault. Because the last pe thing people want to know is that something's going wrong inside of them. Right, so if you can bring in an alien or something else, it's a lot more comforting. Okay, so the bottom line is delusional infestation is a symptom. It is not a cause. It's a symptom of underlying medical issues and it is not a disease by itself. It's simply a symptom. Okay. And I'll, I'll take you away from the pink blotchy wallpaper arm. And, and <laughs> Oops. So any questions? Thank you so much.